I don't have a background in your subject matter, and I'm just like anyone else in the audience. I you know, read the paper, I look, and every now and then I see an article on GMOs, and it says that the biotech and other people have said that we need them and we need chemicals to raise enough food that we're just, you know, the population's growing all over the world, and we need a lot to grow a lot of food. And with a growing population, the responsible thing to do is to use lots of chemicals because that helps grow the food more, grow more food, and we need GMOs. And on top of that, there's even some places like, I don't know where, sure, sure if they said the Philippines, that they had developed a golden rice that had more of a certain vitamin that was lacking. So they were making the article that not only do we need GMOs to feed a growing world, but they have special characteristics that might give us certain vitamins that we might, we might need. So that's the first question. And then the second question would also be, there's a lot of smart, hardworking working People, there's a lot of people like, let's say, Bill and Melinda Gates. They don't need money. They'd like to do good things in the world. Why can't we convince some of these people in their 60s, 70s, 80s who want to have a legacy, who want to do the right thing? If this was so true, why, are we having, why can't we convince some of them to be leaders and speak out? If, the, you know, if they don't have a money motivation, why can't we get them? Why is it so hard for them to take the mantle and say, hey, this is a real issue? Feeding the world. This is the uh, public relations angle for GMOs. And if it were true that GMOs could feed the world, then they would have to, one, increase yield, and increased yield would have to be the, re the way to, in to feed the world, and they'd have to be reliable and safe. And they'd have to be better than alternative technologies that were at least as safe. They fail all of those tests. The IAASTD, ISTAD report, was sponsored by the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and 10 more international organizations. It was signed on by 58 countries. It was written by more than 400 scientists. And it is the most comprehensive evaluation of agriculture and feeding the world ever done. And the authors of that study, and I've interviewed several, including the co-chairman, state unequivocally that genetic engineering, the current generation, has nothing to offer their goals of feeding the world, eradicating poverty, or establishing sustainable agriculture. One of the co-chairs said it's basically a technology looking for a solution. First of all, it doesn't increase yield. The Union of Concerned Scientists wrote a report, Failure to Yield, showing that it doesn't increase yield. In fact, most GMOs reduce yield. Sustainable methods of, of agriculture increase yield in developing countries. There was a study done on over 12 million farms that found a 79% increase in yield. And in some staples like corn and potatoes, 100%. So you have GMOs, which don't increase yield on average, and you have sustainable methods. Then you also have monoculture versus polyculture. If you look at sustainable methods that combine different crops on the acre, they have more nutrition per acre and far more yield that's edible. But the industrial agricultural model ignores everything other than one crop, and so it can skew the results. Rodale Institute grew side by side, organic, soy and corn, and conventional, and then GMO, and found that there was no difference in that monoculture in yield, except in times of bad weather when organic outperformed the GMOs. It turns out, however, that yield is not the key for feeding the world because we have more food per person than any time in human history, and a billion people go to bed hungry or malnourished. It's access to food, it's poverty issues, which are more critical. In addition, GMOs are unreliable, because the practice of genetic engineering creates unpredicted side effects, and these new traits create unpredicted effects with the environment. We see catastrophes all the time. The poster child, unfortunately, for the catastrophe is India, where Monsanto came in and took over the cottonseed industry. They promoted a genetically engineered cotton seed or set of cotton seeds, claiming it would 
basically be the way to riches. And because it's unreliable, sometimes it doesn't even germinate, sometimes it produces smaller bowls, cotton bowls, or the bowls fall off, or there's root rot, or leaf curl, or infestation of mealy bugs, or the quality of the cotton is lower, or it requires more labor. Many, many farmers are unable to pay back their high interest loans that they take from loan sharks at a 7% interest per month. As a result, they commit suicide. Not all of them, but over 250,000. Who plant it? Right, I'm going to be clear with that. Farmers in India have seen two, at least 284,000 suicides. That's the official tally by the government. And the vast majority are farmers that planted BT cotton and were unable to pay back their loans. So it is an absolute catastrophe. In addition, GMOs work against feeding a hungry world because they take money and resources away from the more appropriate technologies. So that's the feeding the world answer. Golden rice is the poster child of the biotech industry saying, see, you have to be for the entire technology of genetic engineering because someday we'll find a GMO that has a solution. And the solution that they say is we need more vitamin A in the children of developing countries. That's true. But their technology is terrible for delivering vitamin A. It's a disaster. It produces a precursor to vitamin A called beta carotene, which typically requires fat in the diet in order to process. The malnourished children who have no access to vitamin A typically have no access to the fat. Also, the beta carotene, when it's produced, the metabolic pathway can produce retinoic acid, which is linked to some very serious diseases. So you might cure someone of vitamin A and kill them with something else. In fact, the process of genetic engineering yields unpredicted side effects. So you might have an oncogene that turns on, so you have a, <coughs> a carcinogen or a toxin or an allergen in the crop that you're feeding to these kids. While there are other technologies available, like Vitamin Angel gives, away, gives two pills a year to kids with mega doses of vitamin A and prevents blindness. There are other organizations that teach people how to create gardens. So they're not just creating the vitamin A that they need, but they're creating a full, balanced, nourished diet. In addition, there's already a red rice with more vitamin A in it than golden rice that's natural. But it's not the sexy new technology that you can patent, and so it's ignored. So vitamin A, this vitamin A golden rice is just a PR scheme. Finally, you end up with people like Bill Gates, who I heard speak a few years ago. He was approached by the Rockefeller Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation is the promoter of golden rice. They're the promoter of the GMO myths. And they surrounded Gates with their myth-making. And if you look at Gates' words, he holds up Pamela Ronald's book, Tomorrow's Table, as one of the most influential books that he's read it is a disaster of science. It is basically a biased, myth-making book. It's mythology, and it's easily knocked down. But what happens is, even though the biotech industry is not great at making safe products, they're very good at creating myths in such a way that they insulate those who are converted, and those believe that anyone who's against GMOs, those of us who are calling for more science, were anti-science. So in the words of Dan Glickman, who was the Clinton administration's Secretary of Agriculture, he was actually promoting GMOs throughout Europe. He said, what I saw generically from the pro-biotech side was the attitude that the technology was good and it was almost immoral to say that it wasn't good because it was going to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. And if you're against it, you're Luddites, you're stupid. And that, frankly, was the side our government was on. He said you felt like you're almost disloyal or an alien by trying to present an open-minded view. 
He said this attitude was written into his speeches. And he diverted from his speech once and actually raised reasonable points about labeling and other things about GMOs. And he said he was slapped around by the industry and the Clinton administration and feared for his job. So this ability to create a groupthink is something that the biotech industry excels at enormously. Fortunately, we're not all part of that groupthink. And we don't need the majority of Americans to tip the scales. So we don't, I mean, it would be nice to have Bill Gates' money, although he has 500,000 shares in Monsanto. I don't think I'm going to get any. <laughs> uh, see, can I add something sure. to that? I think, um, sorry, I don't know if this is going to throw you off at all, but I, that was very well stated for a number of reasons. But I wanted to uh, maybe add something, I think, to help clarify. First of all, um, um, you explained yield very well, but I do think that we need to um, uh, maybe modify it even further because I think that where we get into trouble with the word yield is still looking at short game, still looking at what is right in front of us. And in terms of um, solving world hunger and how it may be applicable in the United States, for instance, but especially more on a global, more uh, a much larger perspective in terms of the human species or survival of our species, is that yield needs to be redefined in terms of long-term um, um, projection. We need to look at um, what can be produced in the healthiest manner uh, with the least amount of resources, with the least amount of death, and the least amount of um, pain and agony over a long period of time in order to uh, achieve sustainability. So yield really has been completely mis you know, malaligned and misdefined for, uh, um, uh, for so many years, and I think that's uh, one of the key uh, reasons. Um, and secondly, I think that is really important to understand is that I'm going to try to help thread uh, a little bit further what he said about the um, myth and how it applies to uh, world hunger. I've been involved in um, uh, a few, I've been honored to be uh, involved in a few nonprofit organizations, but the only ones that I know of in the world that are working with pl purely plant based solutions to world hunger. Um, one of them happens to be in Mozambique, and um, I, I think that. Uh, you know, I'm still always trying to find the positive in just about every aspect. So I, I think that Bill Gates, you know, really does uh, w want to have a legacy of um, of uh, helping humanity. I just think that he is uh, misguided, like many of the rest of the world. And um, but he's very misguided. And and with his ability uh, financially and in terms of. Um, his influences, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, even more of a sad issue than, than what you can, you can imagine. In terms of world hunger, for instance, and how this can be uh, threaded together with what Jeffrey was saying about uh, um, GMO and some of the larger businesses involved in Monsanto, et cetera, is that uh, in 2009, very quickly, in Rome, I mean, that's when they first started really uh, being concerned about projections of, uh, of uh, food um, security issues with um, the calculations of how many people, 9 billion people by the year 2050 and 8.5 billion people by the year 2030. And with meat and dairy products pr projected to double uh, between now and then with uh, diminishing resources without really putting it together, you know, the 1 plus 1 equals 2 um, in terms of, you know, why are we, why are we running into all these uh, serious resource depletion issues? Well, their solution was to... Um, to um, to, uh, I guess, set aside and project 22 billion, it hasn't been realized yet, but $22 billion um, to be placed into specific world hunger funds. The, the, and it was then, uh, again, um, realized in terms of, or, uh, or stated that they will do it again uh, in 2012 uh, with world leaders, with G8 leaders. The issue is, is that um, the... Uh, the propaganda that's been placed in front of us with uh, GMOs and large businesses have now worked their way through these large funders, USAID, and all of the major participating uh, G8 uh, influences, so that um, the main thrust of solving world hunger now with the major funding behind it is established in sort of a, a, a triangle situation. It's got the G8 governments um, supporting and sort of orchestrating funding from 45 major uh, international businesses to then uh, align themselves with 
um, at this point in time, eight uh, developing countries in Africa, Mozambique being one of them that I'm involved with. And um, the difficulty is, is that the businesses that they have a lot that they have created this alignment with are Monsanto, and uh, you know Dupont, and um, and Gates is very much involved in all that because he's been uh, misdirected. So p most of the funding now, um, it's very difficult to be able to achieve any funding because that that's those are the wheels of motion now being being propagated. And so I think that helps you know thread this a little bit. I'll give you just one short example so you can see how serious this is. Is that um, there's, I don't know if you know much about land grabbing, but um, there have been a tremendous amount of millions and millions of acres of land being um, taken up by uh, various countries, um, China, Japan, Brazil, in developing countries to uh, produce animal-based products. Uh, whether, I mean, G the GMO situation comes into play because, you know, they'll all rely on Monsanto for much of their um, seed uh, uh, inputs. But um, one of the largest ones that is t to date underway is something called Pro Savannah, which is taking 17 million acres from uh, the northern section in Mozambique, 17 million acres purchased uh, on, um, on the orchestration of our government uh, with these multinationals uh, forming a triangle from Japan to the, to the governmental officials of uh, Mozambique uh, with Brazil. And uh, if you look on Gates's website, he's very proud to say that um, that they are the primary funders of this, of this project to help world hunger. And what it's doing is, is it's, uh, if you look closer, there are uh, petitions now being uh, drawn up by the four million peasant farmers that are being displaced in Mozambique that have used that land for uh, some of their, uh, I mean, they're, they're doing some other things wrong with, uh, with their pastoral techniques with livestock, but essentially what these, what, what's happening is, is through Gates's funding, uh, the United States involvement, the, some of the other G8 countries, uh, Japan is now partnering up with, with Brazil and moving, you know, displacing these people uh, in the name of uh, trying to uh, trying to uh, pr um, reduce world hunger. And if you look at really what the primary players are in Brazil, they're the ones that have deforested that Amazon. They've gone south now, and they're creating more deforestation in the savannas um, of the Mato Grosso area in the Cerrado, which is an ancient uh, savanna. And they're actually deforestation there is occurring at a faster rate than it is in in um, in the Amazon area because of the funding of Bill Gates. And most of the most of the crops, to bring it full circle, are uh, are uh, most most of it are either grazing cattle. Um, or they are crops to feed cattle, and most of that are soybeans, and they're also being funneled back into China, which is a whole other topic that we can get into later. But I hope that helps, you know, come, you know, bring this full circle with what he was saying.